good evening. Good evening and good morning, depending on where you are joining this webinar. Welcome to LMU's special conference on global marketing. My name is Young Sun Pak. I'm a professor of international business and management at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California, and also the director of Center for International Business Education, often called the CYBE or CYBER using the acronym. This program is funded by the grants awarded by the U.S. Department of Education. LMU is one of the 15 schools in the country that has received these prestigious cyber grants. The LMU Cyber serves as regional as well as national resources for students, faculty, and business community through international business education, foreign language training, and research capacities. As part of our mission, to improve global competitiveness of US businesses, LMU Saab has been offering special lecture series on various topics of international business, such as global supply chain and global talent management. Today, we have invited accomplished practitioners to discuss another theme of LMU Saab, that is innovative global marketing. There is no doubt in my mind that a company's brand's ability to adapt and reflect consumers' core values in different parts of the world directly impacts its sales in those markets. Consumers think of a brand as a good friend and companies need to adapt the brand to what they really believe in life. I'm sure our panelists will discuss these issues in more detail. Before we start the program, I'd like to introduce Dr. Dale Smith, the Dean of College of Business Administration, and ask her to say a few words to welcome everyone. Dr. Smith. Thanks, Youngson. On behalf of the College of Business Administration, we're so excited this evening to be welcoming three amazing thought leaders who will be sharing their perspectives on global marketing. I'd also like to invite the many uh, students in our audience, our colleagues and friends of the college. We're coming together tonight across disciplines to talk about issues speaking directly to the, a changing business landscape. Given the pandemic, it couldn't be more time appropriate and compelling. And it really does speak directly to our, our mission in the college of advancing knowledge and developing business leaders with moral courage and creative confidence to be a force for good in the global community. Brands and global impact really do give a nod to that ethical perspective and having the moral courage to think about what their brands mean globally and thinking about it from a perspective of business for good in that community. They have reach when you're a global brand and they have responsibility now more than ever. So whether we're talking about the brand of vaccine that you might get or as a nod to tonight's speakers, the food we eat, how we might communicate about a brand or how we play, the issue of talking about brand brand marketing and the innovations in a new post-pandemic world are really very timely. So again, on behalf of the college, welcome to everybody tonight. I look forward to a great presentation and discussion among the group. Thank you. Thank you, Dale, for your introduction of the CBA mission and welcome remarks. Now I'd like to introduce two moderators who will lead the discussion with the panelists tonight. First, Dr. Andrew Rom. He's a professor of marketing and co-director of LMU's transformative M School program, which helps our students to build future leaders in the creative marketing industry. He teaches courses in adaptive media analytics, and his research examines consumer usage and acceptance of new media, such as mobile and social media marketing. And the other moderator, Professor Matt Staffel, he's a strategist with over 20 years of experience in the creative marketing industry. He joined LMU as a full clinical faculty member seven years ago to build and lead the M School program together with Professor Rom. Before joining LMU, he served as executive vice president, director of strategic planning at LA-based daily advertising. He also worked with the world-class advertising agencies as well as global companies such as Google, Toyota, Nestle, and Bank of America, to name a few. Andy and Matt, now I'd like to turn the program over to you. You can introduce our esteemed panelists and start a conversation. I know you have prepared the great questions. Thank you. Young Sun, thank you. Thank you to Dean Smith. 
uh, our College of Business Administration, Center for International Business Education, uh, really for the opportunity to bring together three such incredible panelists to talk about their perspectives on current practice and innovations in global marketing. And thanks to all of you, our attendees, for uh, joining today's webinar, including our undergraduate and graduate faculty, our students, our staff, and our industry friends and partners. In putting together today's program, we were inspired by the question of what does it mean to be a global brand in 2021? So how do brands as diverse as Lexus, Taco Bell, the National Basketball Players Association, AKA the NBPA, reach and connect with people in other organizations across countries and cultures, especially during the challenging times of 2021 and beyond into now early 21 and um, as we go into the future. So in our Perspectives on Innovative Global Marketing webinar, we'll learn about global marketing and branding strategy from three really unique perspectives. Our first panelist, Julie Michael, is the CEO of Team One, the agency of record for Lexus and numerous other prominent global brands. Team One is a truly integrated and global agency with digital at its core with 450 individuals with expertise in the area of media planning and buying, advertising, website design and development, social media, virtual and augmented reality, creative experiential activations, user experience design and analytics. So thank you, Julie. Thank Welcome, you. Julie. Great to be here, thank you. We're glad you're here, Julie. Our second panelist I'd like to introduce is Lawrence Kemp, Vice President of Global Brand Strategy and Planning at Taco Bell. Lawrence is all about building award-winning brands, developing leaders, solving unique global challenges, and spearheading new initiatives, including Taco Beta, an incubator team that adapts to the ever-changing needs of the global consumer. Prior to joining Taco Bell, Lawrence had marketing, held marketing positions at Samsung Electronics and Procter & Gamble. At Samsung, he led global retail strategy and innovation, and at P&G, he helped manage several uh, billion-dollar brands, including some you might have heard of, Gillette and Pantene. Welcome, Lawrence. Thank you. And our third panelist, and fresh off the NBA All-Star Game in Atlanta featuring Team LeBron and Team Durant is Henry Q. Gaskins, Chief Brand and Innovation Officer for the National Basketball Players Association. Q is, a, is really a branding and marketing visionary whom I was fortunate to work with at Reebok where he helped transform Reebok from an athletic shoe company to a lifestyle brand by forging relationships with the likes of Allen Iverson, Jay-Z, 50 Cent, Pharrell, and Shakira, just to name a few. Prior to the NBPA, he was the executive vice president of brand marketing and strategy for Def Jam Recordings, and also held senior executive marketing positions at Nike, American Eagle Outfitters, and Dayton Hudson. Wow, it's a star-studded cast here. We're pumped to have Julie, Lawrence, and Q with us today to share their experiences and perspectives leading brands on the global stage. We're also fortunate to have all of you, our audience, with us today. To we encourage you to interact with our uh, with comments and questions. And so, throughout the discussion, there is a Q and A box at the at the bottom. It is not just for Q, uh, but it is for all of the panelists. Insert joke here. Uh, we welcome you to put your own questions and comments in the Q&A box. You can also upvote questions. We're going off script here. We'll see what happens. <laughs> All right, so let's get this game started. All right, so let's just let's just start easy. Um, when we had first written some questions, Andy went right into some real tough stuff, and I said, Andy, we got to ease in here with some with some softballs. So uh, let's get our toes wet and um, let's start with Julie. Julie. Um, and we'll, this, we'll, we'll throw this question around, we can pass the talking stick, but talk about globalization within your agency, um, company or organization, in your case, an agency, but also the company that you, uh, companies that you serve. Paint us a picture of how you interface with the world. Yes, no problem. So the agency I work for is called Team One, as you mentioned in the introductions, and we're part of a global holding company called Publicis Group. And it's Pulis's group with an E because it's a French holding company. So by nature, we are um, quite international in our roots. And what we have found is with the introduction of 
personal data into almost every marketing conversation we're having, that then follows people around the world. So we have become an agency that is both as local as possible and as global as needed. So it's been a really fascinating journey. Um, some of our brands, and I'll give you just a quick snapshot and then I'll turn it over to Q and Lawrence. You know, some of our brands act more global. So we have uh, in our client roster, the Marriott International brands. So premium brands like the Ritz Carlton and St. Regis, those really behave like global brands because people experience them as global brands. We also have Lexus, for example, they actually behave like a national brand more than a global brand because people really experience them at the dealership down the road and with the car in their driveway and with the other vehicles they see on the highway. So it's really been fascinating to watch some companies become more multinational and some become truly global based on kind of their business models. Thanks, Julie. Um, Lawrence, how's, uh, how do you interface with the world? Yeah, so uh, I don't know how many people on the line here have had Taco Bell. Uh, hopefully, if you're in the US, you've had it once or twice. And, um, but yeah, so it, it's fascinating because in the US, we have over 7,000 Taco Bells. So we're pretty well known, you know, in, re in regards to the consumer landscape, Taco Bell is, uh, from a food standpoint, always going to be there. The fascinating thing is, as we've gotten global, uh, and our parent company, Young Brands, also has Pizza Hut and KFC. And KFC is the powerhouse around the world. There are actually over 24,000 KFCs in over 145 countries. So KFC, uh, fried chicken, um, you know, is, is a pretty common brand. But Taco Bell is fascinating because, as we say, Mexican-inspired food has a different challenge around the world. Um, so when we talk about being globally consistent yet locally relevant. Food is a fascinating one where uh, the translation, unlike uh, certain brands like Marriott, uh, doesn't really equate from an international uh, landscape. So you have to really think about it from a local lens as well. And so it's, it's been a, a fun challenge for sure. I mean, just to give you, you know, we'll get into some examples later, but a specific country by country, uh, Taco Bell in a sense has a global consistency, but then very, very locally uh, relevant uh, kind of customization that we have to do. But um, I think it's, it's not just our brand, it's many brands around the world trying to do this. Awesome. Thanks, Lawrence. We're going to talk more a little bit later about um, how distribution, communication, product um, shift from market to market. So I'm, I'm excited to hear what you have to say around that. Um, Q. How does, how does your um, role manifest throughout the world? And just even thinking about uh, the, the players that you represent who come from different places. Absolutely. So I have a unique role in that. Um, I oversee two companies inside of the what we call traditionally the union. So there's the NBPA, which is the not-for-profit historic union that most people know. And then there's a for-profit entity called Think 450, which is where uh, the players have basically taken back their group licensing rights and we basically, you know, go out into the market around the world to try to leverage those rights. So for all intents and purposes, you know, I have players as an audience, I have brands as an audience, I have media as an audience, and I have fans. And I'm dealing with four different distinct groups of audiences across the globe. Um, out of the 450 players, 122 of them are from international countries. Uh, so roughly 27% of the league is currently international. And, um, and then we're also building incredible experiences with our players in different parts of the world. You know, we've had um, experiences built uh, with our Australian players in Australia. You know, there's a new Africa league that the NBA and the NBPA are partnering on to build in Africa. You know, we're heavily involved in the Olympics and FIBA whenever that stuff comes around, because a lot of our guys are actively involved across a lot of different countries and nations when it comes to the Olympics and FIBA. And then our licensees, you know, we have global licensees such as Nike, 2K, EA, uh, kind of you name it, you know, we're in the, we're out in the market dealing with um, global licensees and partners uh, from across the globe. Thanks, Julie. Okay. And, Thanks. And, Andy, I told you that this panel would be great. And he was like, I don't know if these guys are going to have the right uh, experience. <laughs> no, but. I'm, I'm convinced. 
<laughs> you convinced me. So it's it's really interesting that so we have cars, we have premium hotels, tacos, um, the most talented basketball players in the world. One theme seems to be that these are global organizations or there's a global presence, but yet with a, a need to establish that local presence. Um, so here's a question from the uh, Q&A window. And one is for Q and that is, Hugh, could you talk about the challenges in China as there are huge opportunities there, but also huge issues with free speech and political oppression or repression? Yes. <laughs> the, uh, huge issues, huge challenges. Um, we even have to have unique, obviously, uh, ways to connect with that audience and community because we can't do it through traditional US platforms and mediums. So we have to have our own Weibo account. We have to have our own other, you know, all the other social media accounts that um, are relevant in that market. And um, and and it's, it's hard, right? It's hard because for us in, in terms of like um, finding the right licensee partners, uh, a lot of the things that we do on behalf of our players, remember I work on behalf of the players, we call it the Neil business, which is the name image and likeness business. The league, the NBA actually works on behalf of the, the owners and kind of the team organizations. So when you see the Chicago Bulls or the, the Los Angeles Lakers, and they're marketing across seas, that's being managed by the league. If you see players in, as a collective being marketed across seas, then that's being done by the PA. Uh, I don't get in personal individual endorsement deals. I do everything as a group or a collective. And so for us, a collective as small as five and as large as 450. Um, so it's just good for you to understand those parameters in terms of how we're doing business. So a lot of times I'm doing business with companies that want to leverage multiple players in a series or as a collective at one time. And um, a lot of these companies, uh, either they have their own offices and relationships in China and we're dealing directly with them in that way, um, or if there's opportunities where we're looking at to leverage uh, unique opportunities based on our players' passions and some of their key attributes, then we're working through different sales agents and organizations, uh, people that kind of have their boots on the ground, if you will, in the China market. Uh, remember, we're exporting uh, a culture, we're exporting a sport, we're exporting authenticity. Um, so it's a, it's a little bit of an easier sell because I'm selling influence, I'm selling personality, um, and then I'm, I'm selling access to a certain extent. And then brands are connecting that access, that influence, and that impact to their brands or products within those markets. Um, so I hope that answers your questions. I mean, it's, 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 it's a matrix of different challenges. I'm not sure which one you really want me to unpack, um, but there's a lot of different ways that we, we connect with that market and then that audience. Uh, I, I like to tell people there's 300 million people roughly in the US. There's 300 million people in China who play basketball. So imagine if you're walking around the U.S. and every single person had a basketball. That's what it looked like, you know, in, in terms of the amount of people who are playing basketball. Thank you. I was, I was thinking about the fact that the NBA stands for National Basketball Association. Have they ever thought about changing that? I mean, is it really a global organization now? <laughs> I can say the same thing about the EPL, right? You can say the same thing about the EPL. So, and China has its own league, the CBA, right? The China Basketball Association. Um, again, I think because we're exporting, it kind of works. Uh, everyone knows that the NBA is where the greatest players in the world want to aspire to come and play. Uh, so I think it kind of works on our behalf in that way. But I hear your point. I definitely hear your point. So speaking of challenges, I mean, it's obvious that the world is a really diverse place with different countries, cultures, languages, and there are, I guess, pros and cons, benefits and challenges to managing a truly global brand. So let's start with Lawrence. Um, Lawrence, what has your experience been in, in this area in terms of what are the, the benefits and challenges or pros and cons of managing Taco Bell's business um, or maybe food brands worldwide worldwide yeah i mean it's a it's a tough question right because it really depends on uh, the scenario uh, we are a franchise system 
So what uh, we do is as a franchisor, Taco Bell, we franchise the business out to local companies, um, you know, who then manage the brand. And so it is fascinating, actually, uh, going across the landscape. Uh, I was actually stationed in China for a few years to set up our brand with our sister, uh, our partners, Young China, uh, who split off actually from Young several years ago. Uh, and KFC China, uh, if, if you don't know, KFC actually, they are our largest franchisee, our Young China is our largest franchisee in the world. They have over 7,000 KFCs alone in China. And so you can imagine this, the presence uh, and just the dominance that they have there. And when I moved there, they had one Taco Bell. So it was uh, a very different mindset and landscape. So, you know, the fascinating thing in working across each different country is that you will deal with different cultures, different languages, different management styles, and even different, let's say, training protocol. And so there are many different aspects of the business that you have to take in you know, the most, we always say from a marketing standpoint, you have to dive into the consumer, but then from the dynamics of the business, you have to understand how the business landscape works as well from supply chain down to even the franchise management, let's say even like a restaurant general manager. Uh, so the nuances of how culture and different uh, countries work is actually one of the key things that we quote unquote train um, our leaders to go into because even the way you deal with and interact with each country and the people in it uh, is just a fascinating, uh, diverse uh, group of experiences you got to take in. Uh, one, one piece of advice I give to everybody, and I'm sure uh, every, everybody who's on this call can attest, is the only way you can really do it is if actually you do it. You, uh, to do it virtually is one thing, but you have to be there to see it, to smell it, to hear it. Uh, there's no other way to really effectively do that type of business because it is so different by country and even, even within country, as uh, Q was talking about in China. I mean, you're talking about tier one through tier dot, dot, dot cities and the landscape uh, is entirely unique. And then let's say a country like India, you can't even compare. Uh, you know, just the tier levels are so fascinatingly different. So it's, it's really just kind of jumping into it full force. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Lawrence. So Julie Lawrence talked about the, I mean, just the expanse of, of doing business in a, in a country, in a market like China. How does that relate to you with maybe your Lexus client? Yes, I always feel like if you have the word global or the word integrated in your title, your job is just way more complex. And uh, those are both desirable roles, but they also, the, the challenge in wrangling global thinking when there's so many local customs, local business drivers, local ways of doing business. I mean, a brand is really built through a series of individuals. And if I live in Shanghai or if I live in Paris, I experience a brand differently. And, you know, I think brands can have top down messages. But if that rings, you know, in a sort of a deaf way on consumers, it doesn't matter how global you are. It's really, for me, being relevant in each market. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Q, you mentioned Think 450, which is the profit arm of the NBPA. Um, is, does, so how do you, like, is it a, kind of a matrix structure between what international players you might have and then their value that they that re, that they represent in certain markets. How do you like? How do you manage that? Or how do the think, think four fifty folks manage that? Because it seems like it would be a really complex matrix or structure of players and markets. And um, it is. It it actually is. And so we actually have a chief of a uh, of international um, that's connected to our business because to your point of the one hundred twenty two players are kind of spread out between. Africa, Europe, South America, Australia, Canada. Um, and so, so um, and so what we what we also say is that, you know, what makes our sports so unique is while we have 450 of these uh, global basketball players, they're each a star somewhere on the planet. Like guy number 400 is from a small city in Bosnia who happened to make it 
in the U.S. And while he may not be as big of a deal in the U.S., in Bosnia, he's a really big deal, right? And then, you know, guy 171 that's, you know, from Australia, same thing. Like, so, you know, the, the beauty of our sport is that, you know, because of the global aspect of the game, it's a lot easier for us when we start to localize um, or act local on, in, in, in regard to our guys, um, they're stars at the local market. So we say, think global, act local, build community um, is our way of thinking about it. Because we use our guys to really go deep in the community around their passions, around their interests. You know, you've seen more guys wanting to do things around social justice and social impact around the world. And so we use all those things as kind of touch points and gateways into uh, different cultures, um, but we, we build it from the community level up um, mm -hmm. in connection with a lot of our guys. And again, remember a lot of brands when they're connecting with our players, they're coming to our players to get access, access to an audience, amplification to an audience, um, impact with an audience. And so, you know, depending on the market, depending on where you're looking to grow your brand, you know, we have 450 solutions that we could provide. Thanks, Q. Uh, amazing. So Q actually mentioned, you mentioned uh, think, think global, act local. You know, Lawrence, you talked about um, KFC. I mean, there's KFC literally everywhere where Q, you talked about you know, exporting these people and these brands and even this American culture and access to these other countries. Julie talked about Marriott, this consistency that you find throughout the world. So there's definitely things that we want to keep as mainstays of a brand. And then there's certain things that we change and shift and might dial up and dial down. What I'm curious to know from all of you is how do you know what those bits and pieces are that should remain the same? Like what are those things that are sacred that are really part of that global brand? How do you know which things which elements those are, and how do you decipher what are the things that you can um, ultimately change? Let's start with you, Julie. Yes, so the things that are true to a company's DNA, your purpose, your reason for being, the thing that makes the company different, unique, and relevant in the world doesn't change. It's the expression of that that can change market by market. So, um, for us, you know, we often, the head of Toyota, Akio Toyota, once said to us, you will never know our cars better than us, but we will, know our, we will never know our customers better than you do because we're their communications agency. So um, we've got a study that we've been fielding for 10 years. It's called the Global Affluent Tribe. And um, the reason for affluence is because our agency specializes in premium brands and affluent consumers. And what we've learned is, you know, in this kind of new world economy, affluents are more united by five values than by zip code, demographic, income, or anything like that. And I'll give you just the snapshot of these five values, and then I'll turn it over to someone else. But um, the five shared values are mobility, success, status, belonging, and consumption. And over the last five years, they've all started to view those things quite differently. So I'll give you just a snapshot. I'm reading a little bit here from the study, but in terms of mobility, you know, it moved from valuing like portability to embracing full freedom to explore the world. Travel is now more self-expression and, and transformation than it is seeing and doing. Um, success, it used to be from things passed down now it's from things that you create in yourself. The old model of, you know, kind of red carpet and standing behind the ropes is no longer relevant. It's about internal success. Um, status, from collecting rare objects to collecting experiences and stories. I think that's one we all know. I love this quote, which is, curating is the new form of accumulating. That we're no longer in the stuff business. You know, I think we're, Marie Kondo is getting us to purge our houses, not add more stuff in our houses. So I think that's really fascinating. Um, and belonging, more important than ever, being connected in new and different ways. And boy, have we felt that during this pandemic. 
And then the fifth is consumption, which you would think, well, affluence, this is what they do, right? But it really is, has moved significantly away from the opulent and the ostentatious to seeking purpose and meaning. And so to, I'm sorry, I, I strayed a little from the question, but it was important for me to share that a company's DNA and purpose and reason for being can't change and shouldn't change. And that should be a fixed point in their global marketing. But then when you talk about how that relates to customers, then you have to look at insights on those individuals and, the, and those groups and what they believe in and where do those two things intersect is where your communications happen. And thank you for letting me go a little long there, but I really want to make that point about those five values. That was great. I, lo I love the fact that uh, your organization went as far as to say, these are the things that we know are true about this group. And we're just going to become experts in this group. But you also talked about shifts and how these things change over time, that nothing is really fixed for all that long. I was reminded there's a great older TED talk. It's, it's, from this guy, Joseph Pine, and he talked about the shift to the experience economy and how we're getting away from products and more towards um, consumers of experiences and that brands are really in the experience business more than anything else. Um, so Q, for you, Julie talked a little bit about they fielded a study. There is some rigor to identifying some of these things. I'm curious, like what, what's your process for figuring out, like what are those key elements of uh, the collective that you talked about uh, that you can transport or export to these other markets? That's a great question. I think similar to Julie, you know, we, we think about um, our, our organization as being almost like an agency in the sense that our job is to know the players better than anyone else on the planet, right? And so we operate with a players first mentality. And for us, you know, I've been helping the, the organization to understand even how we should be even thinking about brands. And to your point, Matt, you know, the way we look at it is, uh, you know, I'll say a brand is a, a, a promise of quality. And it's a promise of quality kept. And then it's a promise of quality kept that's wrapped in experience. And so... The thing that we're trying to communicate with people is that we can offer their brands and this connection with our players through different types of experiences. Um, you know, uh, when I worked at Nike, it was funny, at a global level, we would often say the product is really the marketing and the consumer experience is really the brand. So what consumers are saying about our brand, what they're feeling about our brand, what they're doing with our brand, um, is really the brand like the, that experience that they're having is really ultimately our brand the product is the marketing it's the thing that's kind of gaining their attention getting them there getting them to stand in line getting them to you know pay whatever they're paying um so i operate off of those types of two principles as we think about our brand and really trying to provide you know the best insights and, and intelligence on our players and try to create opportunities for brands and fans and media and players amongst players to have the right types of experiences. And through those experiences, that's ultimately what defines our brand. And, and our brand is this, this idea of we know our players better than everyone else. We have this understanding that, you know, we operate from a players first mentality and we try to do everything that we call, you know, we call it doing it within the player's voice, if you will. So. That. so so there's a little so the thing is q is that you've got people and people are born with personalities like out the box right taco uh mexican inspired restaurants aren't necessarily born with this stuff although they may have some roots in it so question for you lawrence is you know you talked about expanding into china with this one restaurant, Mexican inspired, what does this mean there? How did you figure out what it is that you should keep? Because that restaurant could have been anything. You transport a person, that person's going to show up as they are, right? But how did you decide, Lawrence? I, I think, you know, Julie was, you know, spot on when you think about the DNA, right? You, you can't transform your DNA. There are core areas of your DNA that you have to make sure, like, for example, behind me or the, the backgrounds, you know, I wish that was my real room. Um, but the, the logo 
is part of our DNA. The color purple is part of our DNA. The rebellious spirit is part of our DNA. But it's funny when we say rebellious, you have to be cautious because even that word, you don't want to use it in certain countries. So as we work with agencies across the world, some of the translations have to be uh, done correctly or very cautiously because there are loose interpretations of how different agencies around the world, even if you had a global agency managing it, uh, it is challenging because the interpretations by market are unique. But when you think about your distinctive core, your distinctive assets, your core DNA, your equity, uh, you cannot transform those. Uh, there are certain things from a communication standpoint that Julie mentioned, that you mentioned, like those are the things that you can tweak uh, and you can localize. But ultimately the brand for us, right? Even though we sell craveable Mexican inspired food, there is a, a, an essence of the brand that we have the core consumer. It stays the same because then your marketing uh, has even tweaks to it, but the fundamental core stays true to what the DNA is. I'm reminded of, um, I saw, I saw a translation of finger licking good. Have you seen this? And it translated to eat your fingers off, which I think wasn't the uh, intent. I'm just, that came back to me in a flash. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I mean, we even live moss, right? It's, it's a statement we've used for many, many years, but it's funny. You ask even people in the U S do you know what live moss means? Some don't even know. They just think it's a, you know, it's a tagline, but <laughs> in international uh, when we've, started going it became like a thing and it's in our restaurant designs in many countries so it, it's really just like how how do you define it and the best part is now content is curated right the consumers give you their feedback now and the way it's transformed from a brand telling you their story from consumers telling you their story about the brand it's actually now the two worlds have merged and so uh, that is one beautiful part about the digital generation today that uh, you know as a consumer to brand standpoint, uh, we've merged into one. I've always loved this idea. It's in like a business strategy um, blog that I read. Brands are not things. Rather, brands are representations of highly valued ideas that live in minds of consumers. Mm -hmm. So it's like to Q's point earlier, a company can talk about a brand all at once. But to Lawrence's point, it's really what lives in their mind that defines their own experiences with that brand. Yeah, great point. The, um, my experience with the Taco Bell brand, a little factoid, Lawrence, I once ordered and consumed in one sitting 13 items off the Taco Bell menu. Thank you very much. Yes, I am now in the Taco Bell Hall of Fame. Uh, <laughs> I thought it might be a good point, good time now to address a Another question from the Q&A. And this one is back to Lawrence. Lawrence, if you were still at Samsung, how would you attack your Olympic sponsorship knowing that it has been not been 110% confirmed that there will be an Olympics yet uh, because of the challenges of the COVID pandemic? And then an extension to that question is how do you, how would you use or how did you use celebrities to leverage your sponsorship, which I assume is the Samsung sponsorship? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good question, right? It's, uh, I mean, contingency planning in this case is all part of the plan. Uh, I mean, let's be real, many, many brands were considering preparation for last year, uh, then got, to, you know, got postponed, and then this year, uh, keeping fingers crossed, even though it's you know, mostly just local, uh, or local um, visitors uh, being able to go. But, the main thing about Olympics or, you know, for example, uh, we, we have a partnership with the NBA uh, at Taco Bell and we, you know, we have something called like steal a game, steal Taco. It's about the co-merger of the partnership brands, right? The equity um, kind of, in a sense, partnership slash borrowing of that equity. So as Q mentioned, like you, you're driving, you, you, you're leveraging that asset. Uh, which is maybe a player, the NBA, the league, et cetera, or the Olympics, uh, they'll create a connection with your consumer. And so when it comes to the Olympics, whether or not it gets postponed, there, there is a, still a connection. The question is, that is the tactic uh, that has to come to life at a later standpoint. That's where the contingency comes. Um, there's no question, Olympics will, will always be. There will be an Olympics, uh, keep your fingers crossed. It's just a matter of the tactics behind it. 
And celebrities are also part of that strategic slash tactic game. Um, and so just really thinking about, you know, at, at Samsung, you know, when we, we, we like had a sponsorship, let's say it was even modern like days, like with BTS, you know, one, uh, one of the largest boy band groups in the world now, uh, why do you have a BTS partnership or why an Olympic athlete is because uh, there was an association with that individual group, et cetera, uh, that has um, an affinity or something you want to um, connect with that fan uh, base of that dot, dot, dot. Uh, so, you know, for us, whether it's Taco Bell or Samsung or any other brand, uh, it's really just a matter of like, what is your consumer strategy? Uh, and then does it tie then with a tactic to drive that uh, business and marketing objective to reach your consumer. So, I, I mean, I, I didn't really address the Olympics question because, you know, I think everybody's dealing with this question right now. Um, you know, a lot of it is comes out of media also. So it's, um, and, you know, Julie, I'm sure can address a lot more of that, especially because a lot of her clients are just dealing with the uh, Olympics right now. Sure. Lawrence. Lawrence, sorry, just real quick. For, for anyone over 21 in this audience, will you describe BTS? Yeah. Uh, you don't have to describe it. <laughs> yeah, it's, just, uh, it's a mind-blowing thing. All I know is I miss my calling in life and uh, <laughs> gone down a different direction based on their success. So, uh, but yeah, just, yeah, if you don't know BTS, please just Google it. There's no question. You'll find out very quickly. Yeah. I can give a little context on Toyota because they are a global sponsor of the Olympics and they were all ready for Beijing. They had all their work in the can. They were positioning, they had all their spots ready, they had all their media buys in place. And as many of us know, the Olympics is significant from an advertiser stand standpoint, it's significantly more about media spend and media visibility. And that's where you spend most of your money when you're a sponsor than the on site activations. Um, that's not true, obviously, for athletes and those that are involved in the Olympics. But if you're a sponsor, that media package is really a, a huge investment. And so Toyota was ready to go with Beijing. Um, and you may have seen one of their Paralympic spots that ran in the Super Bowl this year about Jessica Long, who was an adopted swimmer. And it was, uh, you probably needed to have a box of tissues ready. It was a beautiful story about how she then went on to be a gold medal winner. Um, and we ended up running in the Super Bowl because it was sitting on the shelf ready to go. And it was an inspirational message for Super Bowl. So we still have that work ready. It's in the can. We are hoping that the Japan Olympics happen and that we can run a full media schedule. Obviously, the on-site parts just won't be the, the same. You know, I think it'll be, if it happens, it will be so limited and scaled back in terms of attendance on site that it will be a made-for-TV event is my prediction. Julie, speaking of endorse, endorsers or endorsees and celebrities, and then maybe the, some of the players that Q's organization um, you know, brings to the world, how does Lexus look at that? This is another related question from the Q&A. Um, it seems like Lexus has rarely used celebrity endorsers. Curious to know how celebrities fit into the marketing for Lexus. It's a good observation. Thank you for paying attention um, to Lexus marketing so much. Whoever asked that question, they really have not put their eggs into one, two, or three baskets in terms of celebrities being spokespeople, celebrities being um, featured in their communications. Little known fact for those of you that know the movie star Minnie Driver, she is the voice of Lexus. So at the very end of the spots, when you hear experience, amazing, that's Minnie Driver. So there is a little celebrity factor to that, but, you know, if you're under 35, you probably don't know who she is. Um, instead, Lexus gets its kind of celebrity cred through sponsorships and partnerships. So I've got a list here. Lexus sponsors the Knicks, the Blackhawks, the Wizards, the Lakers, the Clippers, the Heat, the Timberwolves, the Jazz, the Nuggets, the Mavericks, the Pacers, the Cavaliers, the Kings, the Trailblazers, PGA Tour, NHL Tour, and MLB teams. So probably... 50 or 60 teams on a local level. And I'll tell you, our, our local dealer associations love those sponsorships. I mean, you get, and Q probably knows more about this than I do, but you know, you get up close and personal with the talent. You get up close and personal with the team. You get frenzied fans feeling passionate about your product. 
you get media packages, you get product displays on site in arenas and stadiums. It's a, it's a way to affiliate with something people love and want to be a part of, and they hopefully feel that same passion for your product. And we also like it because it's not putting all of your eggs into one spokesman basket. I mean, tragically, if something were to happen to that spokesman that would damage your brand or they would you know, do something terrible in the world or whatever, you kind of want to guard against that as well. I mean, Lexus is such a multi-generational, multi-race, um, multi-gender, multi-state, multi-geography kind of brand that there isn't just one or two names, celebrities, personas that would do justice for it. Mm -hmm. So it's a conscious decision by Lexus. And then we support them obviously through the LDAs with all of their local sponsorships. Thank you, Julie. Throw Professor Rome in the mix as a spokesperson. He's fairly well liked by most people. Um, mm. And so if you're looking for a uh, Lexus spokesperson, um, Andy, he also sings and dances, so. <laughs> no. We'll talk about that. what car you're driving later, Andy. I don't have a car. We only have two cars. I get, I ride my bike. But I would love a Lexus though. Don't let me, uh, yeah. yeah. Lovely car. So, Professor Steffel, should we move to the double jeopardy round? Let's do it. Let's get past this softball round of questions and let's get to the good stuff here. Um, so, We've talked about DNA, and that was really fascinating. How it's the you know the DNA should not vary across markets. Um, that there are these new you know the traditional dynamics happening that might have been exacerbated by COVID, like the feelings of belongingness and the need for connectedness. Let's add one other level of complexity here, and that is, um, let's start with whoever wants to take this one. And that is, how does your product mix? or distribution or even advertising mix address the needs of the different stakeholders that lie within your organization's world. So in other words, moving just from the end user or the, the person in the Taco Bell drive-through or Julie, the, the Lexus owner and driver, Q, maybe the player, what are the other, like how does your, um, your product mix or your marketing mix um, need, to de need to be developed to address the different stakeholders um, within your organization around the world. Like, let's, for instance, Julie, you have, I guess, Lexus headquartered in Japan and the U.S. You have a worldwide dealer network yeah. besides your, your yeah. owners. So it's a great question because so many marketers don't just market to end users it, it is a complex kind of quilt of stakeholders within every brand and you need channel strategies for each one. Um, little known fact, we would always buy a Lexus billboard on the 405 in Torrance because it was right next to their headquarters. And that was just a, a thing we did for employee pride as they would pull into their parking lot. And that was a paid advertising. Of course, the 405 is a wonderful place to market as well, but it was a targeted piece of communications to employees driving into work every day. And, you know, and then you think about the dealer network um, and, you know, fast food and quick service food has franchisees, you know, in every case there is often an intermediary that doesn't allow you to sell product direct to consumers. And we think about the 236 dealers in the United States, the Lexus dealers as really our primary clients. We work hand in hand with them to help them have every piece of information they could need to help them be successful in the market, to help them deliver the kind of service that Lexus is known for. So it's interesting. We work, of course, a ton with the folks at Lexus headquarters, but the Lexus dealers are really, you know, our kind of end game clients, mm -hmm. if you think about it, because that today is the only way to buy a Lexus in the United States is through a dealer. Even if you do 90% of the work online, in the end, the dealer writes that deal. Julie, do you work also with dealers in other countries in terms we, of communications? We do not, but each country would have its own dealer network. 
Uh, the U.S. dealer network is one of the best run and organized. Maybe I'm biased, uh, but they they are often modeled at other parts of the world. So Australia is really trying to put together their dealer network, including like co-op advertising and pooling funds and stuff like that. And um, they're just getting off the ground now. So every dealer network's a little bit different. And obviously the retail and sales laws in each country are so different that they operate, you know, differently. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And Lawrence, so Taco Bell, you have the you have your parent brand or parent company, Yum Brands, and then you have Taco Bell franchisees or owners. How does like how does the marketing mix vary around the world depending on these other, I guess, stakeholders within you know within your world? Yeah, it's a great question because you're right. You know, because we are a franchise system, uh, it really depends on the country and the size of the market that we are in each country. So let's, for example, if there is Taco Bell in the US where we have over 7,000, we have a much larger marketing fund. Uh, and so we're able to buy national media, for example. Um, and then there's countries where they may have maybe five restaurants. You're gonna have far less marketing spend. So then your mix, uh, the influence we have on like that type of program is going to be different. And so that then impacts their P&L and the way uh, and the product focus is going to be different because then your mix strategy is different. And so it really is, it, it's like I was saying at the very start, you got to really, you, you cannot have just a global strategy. That is just the one area you need to localize it because the needs of each country, but more importantly, the needs of each stakeholder are going to be so unique. And so, um, yeah, it's, I mean, really, it, it's, it's so independent. Um, and that's how kind of we take it market by market approach. Got it. Thank you. I have a, quite, I have a question for Lawrence. I, I imagine in smaller markets, especially where, like in the U.S., I'm going to guess that franchises are harder to come by. If I wanted to, um, you know, instead of becoming the next Lexus spokesperson, if I wanted to open my own Taco Bell franchise, it's probably difficult in the U.S., I'm, I'm guessing. It's uh, getting much harder, if that's what you're yeah. asking. Yes. But in countries where it's less developed, right, um, is the marketing, does the marketing mix shift more towards selling franchisees than to selling to customers? Um, it's actually a really good question. Yes and no. So uh, we've been fortunate because in most countries that we've entered, there's actually been an interest in bringing the brand in because it's almost like a first mover advantage into the category. And so the greatest part about the Yelp generation or uh, you know, whatever uh, country local specific food is that there's a shareability of food across the world. And so all types of cuisines are experienced now. And so as Taco Bell's presence, because uh, the beautiful part about media today that even though we show an ad or let's pretend uh, or not pretend, we had, for example, a Taco Bell hotel um, two years ago. The news of a hotel, which, you know, in most people's minds are like, why would Taco Bell have a hotel? It didn't matter. We had one and it was worldwide news. And so uh, any press, any coverage is so global now that word of mouth uh, and visibility spread. So we uh, don't often, like, for example, use PR in a country that we want to drive. Uh, we've been fortunate to actually gain access because either a franchise, a potential franchisee reaches out to us. And uh, typically we don't, uh, you know, I mean, Matt, you seem really renowned, so I'm sure you would be eligible for a franchise, uh, um, a franchise restaurant. But, you know, we usually have to be cautious of the, of the financials because we want to make sure it's not a one store. Uh, there has to be a potential for a large expansion group. Right. I'm in for a minimum of 100. So we'll, we'll oh. talk after. Yeah. So Taco Bell, complicated stakeholder network. Lexus, Toyota, complicated stakeholder network. Q at the so at the NBA level, you have individual teams. At the NBPA level, you've got the players, and then you have Think 450, which I guess was developed to help manage the partnership and licensee deals with the players and the brands. How does that all play out when you're talking about, like you mentioned, players from Croatia or Australia? How do you manage that? level of complexity. I mean, it gives me a headache just thinking about it. No doubt. Um, a lot of it is, uh, we, we consider ourselves having to have a really bespoke approach because there's no one formula that can apply to every 
guy or every brand or every situation. And like I mentioned before, like we're actually talking to many different audiences. So we have a we have to have like a, a B2B strategy with Think 450. We have to have a strategy with the media in terms of how we're helping our players to present their brands, um, both on the court, but mostly off the court uh, within the media relations capacity. And then, you know, also in, um, uh, at the end of the day with fans in terms of how we may communicate um, mm -hmm. some of the things that our players are doing or players are doing with brands or players are doing with other players across the world. Um, you know, we're constantly having to your point, think about all of that and it's a very, but it's, but, but we do it in a, it's not, it's not, there's no way for us to really scale it um, mm -hmm. in that capacity. Where we, where we do scale is through the, the group license. Like uh, Lawrence mentioned, you know, we do a deal. We have a, it's a three-way partnership with Taco Bell, where it's Taco Bell, the NBA and the MBPA, because, you know, Taco Bell wants to use the, the still a game, still a taco uh, 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 promotion, and they're leveraging players within that promotion and, um, you know, because we have the rights to the player's name, number, and likeness, um, they have to do a deal with both us and the NBA in order to get that done. Um, and then when Lawrence was running a lot of those promotions, there were people on our side that were up because a lot of those games were late night, Lawrence. I don't know if you remember. And it was over the Christmas break, I think, when this promotion was running. <laughs> and uh, and um, But we were up late at night, you know, you know, uh, just watching the games and just making, you know, having to, to submit approvals to Taco Bell on the spot so that they could run their ads, run their spots, do what they have to do. Um, but, you know, so that's just one client, you know, and, and as Julie mentioned, there's some relationships that some of our teams and players and, you know, we have through Lexus and doing something similar we were in and uh, approve different things. So it's hard to scale, but, um, but, but we, we do our best. We're, we're involved in every, in, every, in every different aspect of it. Um, Hugh, you were talking about just the real-time nature of marketing. As a matter of fact, it seems like the cycle on every, even like it used to be year-old data was like you were good. And now it's six months. That, gotta be, that month, that data is three months old. That's not, we can't even use that data. And so, and you're talking about that real-time nature of marketing. I remember I was at, Deutsch one time and there was the steal a taco steal a base um get a taco promotion and there was a whole war room that was working on it at that moment to activate it at that very moment that it happened and so this is actually uh there's a question from ariana in the chat and it says hi professor roman stuffful hi ariana uh, my questions for all the panelists media consumption has definitely seen a lot of changes in the past few years but I'm curious to know your thoughts on the rise of TikTok and if you foresee your brands and clients moving to that platform. And the reason I teed it up that way is like there's TikTok, there's Clubhouse and like getting involved in these things um, with all those layers of approvals isn't as easy as it might seem. So I'm going to kick it back to you, Kay, just to talk about, or Q, I'm sorry, to talk about um, it's the, it's the Taco Bell influence on your on your name, I apologize. Um, <laughs> just talk about like how do you how do you keep it real time even when it comes to these new platforms? Yeah, so for us, we definitely have to be up on all the new platforms because our players are on these platforms, and and because we work with so many different brands, some plant some brands are into these platforms and some brands aren't. So uh, that's one of the things I really love about the role and the organization is that you know, we get a chance to really see everything because we have 450 guys that are interested in so many different things from real estate to crypto to, you know, cannabis to you name it. Like, it's just, it's all over the place. And so, um, so for us, we're constantly trying to figure out, you know, what is our role in some of these uh, different social media um, platforms and communication channels. Uh, you know, we're, we're testing and doing things on Clubhouse um, because we feel like it's a, it helps us with a couple of things. One, to build thought leadership as a brand. Two, it helps us to build more engagement around our players, build credibility around our players. It's a way we can invite in brands and kind of give them a inside the locker room kind of peek in terms of some of the conversations that are happening around sport or happening amongst players. Um, and then it gives chance for fans around the globe 
to kind of tap in and just listen in on different conversations that we may be having. We collaborate a lot with the NBA on the platform. So they've been testing, watching live games and then having commentary. So it's like almost like a, uh, wouldn't call it, I guess it is a second screen because Clubhouse is still on your phone, but it's almost like how do you have a second screen experience while you're, you know, watching a game and then you have these cool influential, you know, players and people from the culture providing commentary and feedback and comments on the game or different aspects of the game. And so it makes the game that you're watching even that much more interesting. Um, so yeah, we're, we're experimenting with all of it. As a brand, we haven't done anything personally as a brand on TikTok. I don't, we haven't figured out what our role might be in that, but we have helped other brands get access to players and develop campaigns and strategies and tactics, if you will, uh, for them to execute and using players on TikTok on their platform uh, or through their channels um, on TikTok. So, um, so yeah, and we, 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 we're experimenting with IG Live. How do we leverage that? Um, Facebook Live, you know, we're, we're creating our own YouTube and content channel. Everyone's into short form content, snackable content. Um, and, and the challenge for us is, you know, I've kind of conceded as an organization, right, that the NBA has done an incredible job at what I call the 48 minutes of the game. And so anything on the court, I can't really compete with them. Like they do it better than anyone else in the world. I feel like it's really my job and my team's job to help players with, with what I call the 2312, which is the other 23 hours and 12 minutes of their day. So there's 48 minutes when they're on the court and they kind of have that contained with the NBA, but then there's a whole another 23 hours and 12 minutes of their day where they're gaming, they're investing, they're being fathers, they're being husbands, they're investing in real estate, they're doing startups, they're going back to school, like there's just so many, they're starting fashion companies, they're doing music, and so how do we start to help them, you know, in building their brands and building those opportunities and using all the platforms, and it's a lot, you know, it's a, but yeah. at that point it's like, we, we are, um, we have a lot of resources and, um, you know, we're building a network of relationships with uh, other influencers and other kind of support people um, that we can kind of put them in touch with to help them navigate some of the different passions and interests and things that they're doing. Uh, I love that idea of the clubhouse being, it's kind of, clubhouse is a little bit like Twitter, but you get to hear people. Exactly. And so you get that live commentary. Um, Professor Rome and I have been playing around with some, some clubhouse tonight at 6 p.m. Yeah, absolutely. you can tune in tonight at 6 p.m. We're on. I think exactly. you'll, you'll, you'll double our audience if you show up. <laughs> um, so we'll appreciate that. Julie, to you. So I, it sounds like it sounds like Q has a lot of flexibility in terms of being able to experiment. I don't know if is, is Lexus or your other clients, are they that open to off-the-cuff experimentation or does it require a bit more planning? How do you stay up to date on the things that are coming down the pike? Yeah, so obviously when it, there are two types of social engagement. There's organic social engagement and paid social engagement. So if you're a brand, you're going to have organic uh, communication through your own channels. And then you can buy media in social channels as well. So for example, I did an audit of all the money we send out the door on behalf of our clients, Google and Facebook and Instagram are by far the biggest place we spend money. It used to be that there was no must buy on a media buy, you know, put two partner, put NBC against ABC, put uh, Condé Nast Traveler against Travel and Leisure and, and send out RFPs. You can't run a brand today without spending a ton of money on Google and a good amount of money on Facebook and Instagram. So that's fascinating um, to watch that big shift. Also all of the, uh, there's so many awesome social platforms right now. I'm personally a huge fan of TikTok. I can't, I'm spending way too much time on it. My teenage sons are all like, mom, that is so cringy, get off there. We, we're trying to have our own social channel, please. <laughs> um, I also think about Twitch. I don't know who's all involved yeah. with Twitch these days, but we just did a seven figure deal with them on behalf of some clients. Um, it is such a growing platform for it's basically a voyeuristic platform. You're watching other people do stuff for the most part, um, but always experimenting with podcasts, new channels, and always doing it both organically and paid on behalf of our clients. It's critical. And in the end, it comes down to who you're targeting. 
Like Lexus really isn't on TikTok right now because their buyers aren't there today. But as an agency, we're experimenting in that in TikTok all the time. But Lexus is on Twitch because they love gamers and they got this really awesome sports car that just came out that's like gamers are gonna love it. So they're on on Twitch. So it's uh it's a topic I love and it's so fun to watch these new platforms. I would end with a challenge, which is what is really a large media company anymore? You think about a mega media company and how you used to define it in, in your minds. It was probably a network. It was probably an ESPN or an NBC or something like that. I don't know that there are large media platforms anymore because consumers have hijacked all of it. Like the reach is really in social inter interactions. In, in, and of course, you know, a lot of streaming stuff. So just an interesting thing that, that I've been thinking about a lot lately you know, what is a media company anymore? Yeah, it's fascinating. No, uh, oh, sorry, Matt. Please. No, please I'll go ahead. One other thing. I mean, you know, it, it's funny because when we think about all the platforms that were and then what they are today, like how much they've transformed, it is incredible. But um, Doyin came out, or sorry, Doyin, which is TikTok. Um, so but Doyin was, is the parent company who created TikTok. When they came out in 2016, um, they reached out to KFC, Taco Bell, and et cetera, saying, hey, do you, do you want to try something? And so, uh, you know, the other challenge I would say is don't be afraid to try because it's, it, the risk is very small at the start, but you could be that catalyst, um, you know, for a brand, but more importantly for that consumer uh, to really engage in a very different way. I mean, I don't think any of us here would have thought TikTok would have blown up at the pace of where it is today. I mean, the amount of consumption that happens on TikTok is frightening. And it's like, uh, uh, I, I have many friends who work there and it's just like, wow, I, just what they're curating, but most importantly, how they're innovating the platform uh, is one thing. But the reality is there's probably 20 more in the pipeline of other companies that are forming based on a human interaction that's differentiating over time. And so a lot of these designers and engineers who are a part of these companies, they always move. And they think about new platforms that can engage consumers in different ways. So the challenge is don't be afraid to experiment, right? Be the first on something and then have fun with it because that's where you can actually kind of break the market in a way. Love that. And there's this, uh, there's this like nasty rumor that social media marketing is free and easy, um, which I'm sure, I don't know if you've experienced that from prospective clients. Um, but to be in these places and to show up in the right way does take some some thought and some like, and again, I think it really goes back to the beginning of our conversation, which is who are we as an organization? What do we stand for? What's our voice? Um, and then how do we show up appropriately in this, in this platform? So we're gonna, we're gonna start to transition a little bit into um, some future focused stuff. It was a nice um, stepping stone with the TikTok conversation. But we've talked about, um, you know, what elements should stay the same, what elements of our marketing mix might change. Um, we talk about China, 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 China's on the mind. What other white space opportunities are there that people aren't talking about so much? Um, where might we want to focus a little bit of attention? Q, you talked about maybe, I think it was Bosnia, maybe you had some, you had some smaller countries by thinking a little bit um, that we have the opportunity to act, you know, really hyper-local globally though. Um, so maybe I'll kick it over to you, Q. What's the white space? Oh, what's the white space? Um, what is the white space? I mean, we've been, from a country perspective, um, I still feel like, you know, there's a, 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 I mean, everyone knows there's a huge opportunity in Africa, but no one has really minded yet or leveraged it yet in a way that I think has been meaningful. So. I think there's stu still a huge opportunity with that lead coming into Africa to see what's there. Um, we've been doing a lot with, you know, from a player perspective, like uh, our, 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 I collaborated with our chief of international and we created what we call the IBA, the International Business Academy. And we've taken players to, you know, to really get them to understand the power of brands and how global brands 
um, how they should be thinking and interacting and working like global brands. And so, you know, during the summers, we set this academy up. And for the past two years, we've gone to Milan, Italy to do this. And, and we went there for a variety of reasons. One, it allows them to interact with a, lar a lot of large fashion brands. We do it like either a week before Milan Men's Fashion Week or a week after, because a lot of our players are interested in fashion. But then we also have taken them over to Lamborghini and Ferrari and Gucci and a lot of those type brands where they get to meet with the CEO of those companies. And, you know, we're providing this really great experience for them. Um, we've also taken them to different vineyards. We've taken them to different Michelin star restaurants in Italy, just so that they can kind of have this, uh, you know, more, you know, global and cosmopolitan kind of brand experience. Um, so I think there's more, like you're gonna see more um, players, what I call like the hyphenated player, like back when Andy and I was working together at Reebok, it was almost taboo for a player to do anything beside sport. Um, it was often frowned upon. And, you know, today, you know, just like many of us, we're celebrating the different, you know, um, uh, parts of our heritage and where we come from, you know, players are now celebrating and, 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 and enjoying this more, what I call a hyphenated life in terms of being more than just a basketball player, being more than just an athlete and, and really experiencing that. And then, you know, obviously this isn't, you know, uh, it's starting to become really more mass, but for many of us on the phone, it may not be new, but I think this whole crypto blockchain NFT space, you know, we're having a, a nice uh, run, if you will, with the whole Top Shot, uh, you know, um, NFT crypto experience. Uh, I think we're going to see more of that. I think we're going to see, you know, uh, more more players releasing, you know, um, uh, art and music and, and just people in general doing more things with NFTs. So just that whole blockchain crypto NFT space, I think is a huge white space that, you um, you know, we're going to be starting to pay a lot of attention to around the globe as it relates to our players. So here we got, we got NFT and BTS. Um, and we're really, people are going to figure out real quick if how old they are this. NFT for the audience is non-fungible token, which is you can buy digital things that only one would exist for you. And so it's a pretty, it's a pretty new idea that's gaining in, in popularity. Julie, what's the, uh, what's the white space? Well, we still have geographies and countries that have so much growth in them. China, India, Africa, uh, such big populations and just growth to be had. I also, and this may be a personal opinion, I'm watching our global division of people be really more polarized with the haves and the have nots. And I just think there's so many people, an increasing number of people out there that don't have their basic needs met and an increasing number of people out there who have four homes and are buying another house in Aspen as we speak. And the, and this is not a political statement in any way. I think it's actually an economic challenge for business, which is how do we appeal and be considerate to those that are working to have basic needs met and help and how do we also appeal to affluent people who want to make a difference in the world? So it's less about kind of accumulating wealth and more about living a life of worth for everybody. And so for me, and I don't have an answer, it's just what I'm seeing is a big problem that it's not just a political and economic issue, but maybe one for businesses to address as well. Love that, I love that. There was a question in the chat that maybe um, in the next, part we can get to, but it's thinking about kind of corporate social responsibility and how that fits in your brand. So we're gonna, we're gonna come back to you on that. Um, Lawrence, do you see any, do you see any white space? Yeah, I mean, as Julie mentioned, geography is definitely one of the key ones, right? Just you got a lot of countries to cover. And so uh, that's, but that's just a, a common one. I think for us, as we think about white space, we think about access and that can be in many forms. COVID made one thing very clear. Access can be transformed in various ways. Delivery was never this big um, pre-COVID, right? Companies like DoorDash, they were still fairly small and now they're behemoths, um, you know, just because of the landscape. Uh, companies like Deliveroo, same thing. And so it's 
it's just a matter of what will be that next form of access for the brand, whether it's via digital, uh, whether it's via third party aggregators. Um, I mean, there's just many different ways, even the way we design our restaurants uh, to be accessible for consumers. And then, you know, in regards to the economic, uh, you know, kind of factions in a way, that is something I think all of us are considering because that access, whether it's food or another consumable product or even content like NFTs, which still blow my mind, by the way, Q. Uh, yeah, I, I still don't get it, but, you know, it's huge. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, but this access, whatever it is, even to NFTs, how do you, in a sense, democratize uh, that so that no matter where you are in the world, you know, consumers have that because then that true white space can be addressed. Uh, but it really comes down to who are you targeting to get that access to. Love that. Um, should we, you know, the more, as, as I'm listening to this, you know, uh, Elon thinks that we are all living in a simulation. And the more that we talk, the more I'm like, I actually think we might be living it with NFTs and, you know, third party distributors of food orders. Um, this isn't real. Uh, Professor Rome, should we talk a little bit more about the future with some uh, crystal ball questions? Oh, I think you're muted. Let me get to one of the questions that uh, was from one of our M schoolers. And I was so excited that she was part of this. I erased her question when I replied, hello, Anne. So this is from Anne and I'm gonna paraphrase. She was at the IAB conference, um, the Interactive Advertising Bureau, I think it is. And she wants to know about how our privacy regulations and the do like you, we have the, the European standards. Now we have a California standard. We had the, um, how do you manage privacy issues in your marketing throughout the world? And I'll leave that up to either Julie Q or Lawrence just to jump in because this is like the quadruple jeopardy round type question. I mean, is that something that you even deal with? Julie, do you want to? Yeah, I can, I can start us out here. So and I also saw a question come in about a cookie-less future online, which right. ties to this question. So um, it's adding a lot of complexity for our clients, depending on how much data they keep on their customers. Um, you know, departments are being set up to handle the local laws and the state laws on transparency and all of the um, regulations that, that rely on data. I'll tell you, our parent company, which is Publicis Group, spent $4 billion a couple years ago on a company called Epsilon because they put a big bet on data. Epsilon is uh, one of the top individual and trans transactional data owners in the United States. So basically, as cookies go away, we will be tracking people by what's called either PII, personal identifiable data, or anonymized identifiable data. The difference is Q Gaskin's name is associated with one and not the other, but we would still track his behavior in the same way. Um, and so what will happen is your individual identity is going to be the thing that marketers track. And instead of being able to track it through your click patterns, we're going to have to track it through your visa card patterns, through some other behaviors either geography through your phone where you're traveling or your purchase patterns because we're not going to be able to get at them through your linear click patterns anymore. So, I mean, it's it's creepy in some ways for sure. And that's why they're anonymizing data, but still are, um, we're going to track people not as groups, but as individuals moving forward. Mm -hmm. Lawrence, do you have any other thoughts on that? No, I mean, it's, I think all of us are dealing with the same scenario. Uh, the other thing is outside of experts in this area, also you need a good league team um, involved. Yeah, I just, I mean, yeah, you just, you know, it, this is a uh, all hands effort uh, in, in, in a, just evaluating the future of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like to be also a moving target that is very difficult to keep your kind of finger on the pulse of what's happening, so. Like Julie said, you probably have entire departments and teams looking at this. Um, Professor Stuffel, should we um, begin to wrap up with a uh, globalization versus localization question? Let's do it. 
Can I, can I preface this question with an article that I saw from the BBC? I'll just read you the title if I still have it up here. Hold on, I might have closed it. Nope. Uh, it was, uh, will coronavirus reverse globalization, right? So we were on this trajectory towards true globalization. And all of a sudden, we found ourselves retreating back nationalism, rise of nationalism. Um, and so the, the, the question is, you know, if we're thinking about the future, do we think that it's, we're gonna continue to contract more locally? Or once this all kind of blows over, if that happens, will we be back sort of sprinting towards globalization? Um, Lawrence, do you wanna, actually, Q, let's kick us off. No, I, I would defer to someone else. On this. Okay. <laughs> Lawrence. We, we, we've been, uh, I would say, studying this a bit, uh, and trying to analyze. I mean, this is like a crystal ball thing, right? Uh, the main thing that we're learning is the world is still globalizing. But the, the main aspect of the localizations is, I think what Q was mentioning earlier, which is the communities. And it's really about the community versus the local or the national, right? Because now, as we see in the local communities, uh, you see a lot more um, support being driven on a local level. But it's really about the community that I would say uh, it is maybe like in regard, like as a whole uh, versus like a nationalistic thing. Um, so it's a tough one because things are beginning to shift, but the challenges, the dynamics by country are very different. Uh, we're seeing like recoveries by country on a very different scale. And so it, it's, you can't, like, there's no one-to-one -one correlation across the countries that we're seeing right now. And so, but the one theme we, we continue to see from the start of COVID um, is the fact that community is really becoming such a critical com component to the way uh, we as a human society are really driving towards, uh, which is uh, a, such a true blessing to see uh, despite such a, a pandemic situation. And I, not I, I think a lot of the trend experts are seeing that that is gonna going to continue uh, as we move forward uh, if, with, if we had a crystal ball, but that is actually a trend that we hopefully will continue to see. Well, it's interesting to think about, you know, the first place my mind goes, especially COVID related is my, local community, my neighborhood. Uh, but we have all these, the communities have now become global though because of the internet. We can connect with people, like-minded people all over the world. So maybe it's less about geography and more about mindset, affinity, interest, purpose, cause, things like that. Julie, some thoughts? Yes, my answer to this would be, it depends on I mean, I guess uh, of the three of us on this call, I, I work with multiple clients and multiple companies. And so for me, it really depends on who it is. So the Ritz-Carlton Hotel Company is a truly global brand. When you experience it, it's through global travel. The way they recruit and move their staff around the world, it's so wonderful. I mean, they were so diverse from the onset because they move people from uh, Shanghai to London, London to New York, New York to Florida, Florida to Tokyo. I mean, it, it truly is a global brand and the way people experience it is really global. Um, in fact, their theme is let us stay with you. So it's the idea of creating indelible marks in people's minds versus a hotel company saying, please stay with us. So in this case, there is nothing regional or local about the way you market other than when you're doing a local Mother's Day brunch at New York Central Park. But for other brands, you know, a national approach like Lexus just makes more sense because you, they don't, you don't experience the brand in other countries. You experience it in your local neighborhood. So, um, you know, I think the idea of global marketing is more complex and probably the reason you're having this panel, than it sounds. Thank you, Julie. You know, back to what our CBA Dean, Dale Smith mentioned at the beginning, how the how this college of business is defined by um, 
moral courage as one of the kind of tenets of our mission. And one of the questions from the chat is, uh, to all three of you, how do you make decisions around corporate social responsibility and build that into your brand? In other words, what, like what, to what extent does CSR play into Q? It could be your individual players and what they're doing, maybe um, at the community level. Yeah. So Q, what do you so, think? So, yeah, so, so that, that's actually a, a one I can jump in on heavily. Um, Cause you saw, all of you saw, um, well, most of you watch basketball, saw the bubble when all the players, all the games were in Orlando. And, um, you know, there was a lot of commentary, you know, socially around should players be playing at this time. And, um, you know, given everything that was happening in the world with the Black Lives Matter movement and things of that nature. And, you know, what the players collectively decided was that, you know, the platform of the league provided them a stage where they could really shine a spotlight on the issues and the, 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 the things that they really cared about the most. And so, you know, they figured out ways to do it in very symbolic ways, like putting stuff on the court and putting things or taking their names off the back of the jerseys and putting the names of things that they really believed in or other things that they wanted to, you know, have a, 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 some social commentary around. Um, but, you know, as I said from the very beginning, everything we do is with a player's first mindset. Everything we do is to represent the player's voice. And so, um, you know, we, it, it, this, this idea of corporate social responsibility is really embedded in our DNA because all of our guys, they're global stars that play on a national stage in the US and they're local hometown heroes, right? And so, you know, they have corporate social responsibility at a global level. So they have things that they're interested in like world hunger or world poverty or sustainability or whatever it might be. And then they have national causes that they connect with like, like we just did with this past uh, All-Star game, giving uh, a lot, shining a spotlight on historically black colleges and universities and really putting a light on education but then they're also at the local level, you know, working with their local neighborhood with, you know, whether it's a turkey drive during Thanksgiving or a toy drive during Christmas or, you know, giving back to a local rec center that they grew up playing ball in and, and, and really bringing that rec center, you know, raising the prominence of that rec center and, the, and, the, and its uh, equipment. Um, you know, they, they're, they're involved at all three levels. And it's our job to you know, find ways to make sure we protect them in those ways, support the initiatives that they're doing, and then to amplify all of that. So we're doing deals with, you know, because of the, uh, the, the tone of 2020, there were a lot of deals that were coming in around brand partners that were interested in the whole diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, for example, we did something with Dove where they wanted to focus on messaging using, you know, specifically towards men but had a social responsibility kind of tone and message to it. We had eight or nine players that were involved in that. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a really big part of what we're doing. We have a foundation um, where we, you know, take proceeds and match efforts that our players are doing around the globe. You know, we have African players that are building hospitals in certain countries. We have other players that are, you know, I guess just, you know, uh, supplying PPP equipment to every PPE equipment to, you know, um, their communities. And um, so, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a huge, huge, huge uh, big part of what we do to the point where we even, you know, I think as we move forward as an entity, you know, it's going to become um, almost like a cost of doing business with players. Like they're, they're, they're more, like they're at a level now where it's not, it's not the days of being endorsers are not really um, that appealing and that interesting to them. They're, they want to be, you know, investors. They want to be owners. They're into the equity aspect of it. But more importantly, they want to have impact. Like they're really looking to find ways to have people rethink of what they mean as athletes and really see them as people that can have impact. That if they pull their collective resources together, they can really start to do some amazing things around the world. When you think about what LeBron is doing with his school, what Russell Westbrook has built a middle school and a high school in LA, 
Like you're gonna, see it, that's not gonna stop. You're gonna see more of it. You know, they're involved in politics. Like it's 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 unlimited. And I'm so proud of all of that work. And um, and it's having impact. It's having impact on other sport leagues. It's having impact on brands. And it's having impact on all of us as a coach. Hugh, what you've just talked about is is super inspiring. I think for a lot of us here as panelists as well as the audience, and I can't think of a better organization to to that is better prepared and better suited to leading this charge than the NBA and the NBPA. So thank you for and your players and everything that you all are doing to um, to lead those efforts. Absolutely. Julian Lawrence, do you have any other things to add? We just have a couple other questions from the uh, final, final questions from the from the chat to get to. But any additional thoughts on the uh, CSR angle? The only thing I would add is just how important it is that we take care of underrepresented communities within our workforce mm -hmm. and make sure that we are hiring without bias and that we make sure our workforces mirror the communities that we serve and everybody's talking about it, but we really need to do it and do it together. And it starts, and, and I, I know all of you at LMU are thinking about this a bunch because you're, you're helping new minds come into the workforce. And so you're such an important part of all of us building this dynamic, beautiful, talented workforce. And it's not just because it's the right thing to do. It's because ideas and solutions are better when you have more opinions and more backgrounds around the table. So um, I just wanted to acknowledge that and put it out there and say how important it is for so many companies right now to just be a part of the solution here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, uh, one question that we wanted to get to is um, from the Q&A and that is um, interested in entering the digital marketing industry and the question is how are you able to market your company goals through a local and global lens in other words do you feel you have to curate to specific cultures and this kind of ties back to the beginning of the of the session um, in terms of, of uh, you know how do you revise the marketing or manage the marketing mix across cultures. So any thoughts on that? Do you have to feel, do you feel that you have to curate or create specific content for specific cultures? Or are we truly in a global Sorry, like, yeah. just wanted to uh, clarify by company goals, uh, do you mean like corporate goals or brand? I'm just trying to make sure. Yeah, we, could, we could define it as brand, say brand goals. And sorry, curating it for the specific markets. Mm -hmm. Right, or cultures. Gadget, I, I, Q, Drew, I don't know if you want to start this one. I'm so trying to. Uh, understand the specifics of the question. I mean, I think okay. it relates to what we were talking, how you, you try to come up with, you have DNA that fit across cultures and countries that represent your company or your brand um, in terms of messaging. Like, how do you manage the, the local or the, the regional markets so that you may not have one global message, but your, um, you know, your efforts are to create more specific messaging around cultures or or specific markets. I have a. I I, I don't know if y'all followed what Apple did for Lunar New Year. Did you follow this? This thing is they did. Um, they they commissioned Chinese artists to create Lunar New Year illustrations. Um, but what it was so interesting about it was it was geared towards the youth and the the gestalt of the art was about reframing success in the context of the youth generation done through the lens of a historical um, moment, right? This kind of long-term moment, which I thought was so interesting for one, for Apple to come out and they really broke their brand 
the, the kind of the things that you would expect them. Oh no, I'm sorry. It wasn't Apple. It was Beats. It was Beats. It was Beats. But, but it didn't look or feel kind of like the other Beats stuff that they had done in the past. Um, but they really kind of curated this moment. But then they brought in their POV or at least the voice of the consumer in through their work, uh, which I thought was an interesting example. But did it run globally or did it just run in the US? It was, uh, it was all in Chinese. So I'm gonna presume that it ran in China. Okay. That, is a, that is a presumption that I will verify. And I will, when I send over my, when you were talking about Italy and uh, Lamborghinis, I was like, I want to work there. So I'm going to send you my resume. <laughs> and I'm also going to send you um, the answer to that question. Yeah, I mean, I think the one reality is global ads are very hard. Uh, you know, the translation alone of some of the concepts are very challenging. And this is not going to address the brand goal question, but more of just from a communication standpoint, if this is kind of the direction we're going with. You know, there are so many cultural nuances you have to account for, right? I mean, just, I mean, holidays alone are very unique by country, uh, let alone just the message itself. Food is a little easier. Craveability in most countries is going to be pretty consistent, especially with things like maybe cheese. And so we have certain platforms that have a universal truth to them. It really comes down to, um, you know, when we have local customs, for example, like a soft shell crab taco may not work in uh, some other countries. I know, I'm sure some people are going, wow, that sounds amazing, while others are like, Ugh. Uh, so it's just like, yeah, you know, you, it really will depend, but the way the platform or the way the campaign is brought to life is also unique by culture. We talked about the platforms like Facebook, Instagram, those are now becoming more universal. So the methodology of how we distribute that content could be somewhat similar, but now a lot of countries have their own specific ways of bringing uh, conversations to life, like Line in Japan, Kakao in Korea, um, you know, we, we Xing, or Weixing or WeChat in China or Weibo, like there's just so many different ways that the content can be executed. So, um, you know, but it comes down to what is the strategy in the campaign? And then can you take that singular strategy and then figure out how to localize it based on the, the market that you're trying to target? So, I mean, I'm more of a, it's more of a general a generalization, but uh, and I don't know if I answered the question, but that at least uh, that's what I'm telling what I'm taking from it. <laughs> Thank you. That question, that could be another two hour webinar, but thank you for, uh, for your thoughts. Um, one, of the, one of the audience uh, says, this has been an amazing conversation, everyone. Clap, clap. The panelists were awesome. However, the moderators were just so so. Uh, that's from Professor Mitch Hamilton. Mitch, we're glad you were able to join us. Um, Q, thank you again for allowing us to keep you up late two nights in a row. Julian Lawrence, thank you for allowing us to cut into your dinner time or family time or second shift at work. Um, I know young son, Professor Peck, wants to um, say a few closing words and then we'll have to wrap up. Uh, thank you so much, Andy and Matt, uh, for moderating such a stimulating and intriguing panel discussion. Uh, it's been more than an hour and a half. We still have more than 70 people I can tell the audience is very much engaged and we can continue this conversation throughout the night. How about that? Before we wrap up this webinar, I like to use my prerogative as an organizer of this webinar and want to ask one last question to all the panelists. We have many students attending this webinar today. I'm wondering what kinds of skills, for example, digital skills, communication skills, you think would be the most important for our students to acquire if they want to work for your company, conducting businesses in the global market. So maybe start with Julie. Sure, I'll take this one. Uh, we love hiring LMU students and uh, we find that they are often very prepared for many parts of of business, you know, we lean into creative problem solving because we're an agency. I love people who can write. I think having writing skills, and it doesn't mean traditional sort of, you know, English paper writing, but people who can make you feel something the way they write, people who can 
take 20 words and turn it into three words. People who can just kind of move you through the written word. That's a, that's a really special gift and it's hard to find people who can do that. I would also say people who can move you through pictures and images. <laughs> you know, we've become such a visual society. We learn through videos more than we learn through reading now. And, you know, video drives, if you look at our I have three teenage sons, I think I mentioned that they, they consume 90% of the world through video on their phone. So um, for me, people who can express ideas visually and people who can write, I love. And in terms of looking for a job, I would just say, and this is maybe a little pro tip here. You know, I used to hear all the stories about send your resume on a pizza box and, you know, put something on the building next door to get noticed. I love people who just write a wonderful um, kind of introductory message, who have a thoughtful resume, who send a great thank you note about one thing that's interesting. I mean, really, it's sort of check the basics and you will get on the radar and, and don't give up. If you don't get the first job that's open, I'll tell you how many times our recruiters have had someone call them every three to four weeks and say, I'm just checking in again, I'm just checking in again. And by that third or fourth call, you'd be surprised. For those that are really persistent, they tend to find great jobs. So uh, those would be my tips and skills that I personally really am attracted to in candidates. Right. Thank you, Jermaine. I, I would say <clears throat> for me, from my point, I agree with everything that Julie said, um, especially the, the visual and the, the writing part, huge, huge skill set that I think is needed across uh, a lot of different industries. And it's mostly because of how we're consuming media now um, as, as just and in, in how our young people are growing up in their, in their world. But I would add for us, um, relationship building is huge. Like in sports, you have to have this ability to build relationships with players, relationship with the media, relationships with brands, relationships. So just strong networking skills are essential. Um, problem solving. Uh, because, you know, think about my, I mean, I'm dealing with issues now with a certain player I won't name, but, you know, we have different problems that, you know, come up every day with 450 different players. So just being able to have strong problem solving skills, not being scared to jump in and, and, and try to solve a problem. Um, I call it a figure it out trait, like really having what I would call a figure it out trait is super important. Um, I would say especially for young people, this that um, marketing has really become um, what I would call uh, performance marketing. So it's all analyzation and measurement. So being able to analyze and measure and understanding numbers and being comfortable with it, I'm, I'm sorry, you, you can't escape it. Like it's just, no matter what it is you wanna do, you can have the coolest job in the world, with, you're gonna still have to measure your results. You're still gonna have to measure your engagement. You're still gonna have to measure certain things that are related to it. You know, as Andy did tell you, I get to go to some of the coolest parties, but I have to justify all that stuff through a ROI and some type of measurement. So um, analyzing and measuring, don't get scared of it, embrace it. It's here to stay. It's, it's how you drive the marketing business in real time. Everything is moving at the speed of light. So you need the analyzation, the measurement. And then the final for me is just, and it's going back to Julie's point, the art of storytelling. So, you know, just being really masterful in terms of how you tell a story, you know, and, and, and especially in the job market, having your elevator pitch down, being able to get to your point, knowing what you want to do, like you've done the research. I get so many people all the time to say, I want to work in sports. I want to do what you do. And then I ask them, well, what do I do? and they can't explain what I do. So, you know, really doing your research and kind of understanding the different roles and, you know, just the different opportunities that exist. And um, uh, yeah, so th those would be my four things. Relationship building, problem solving, analyzing and measuring, and the art of storytelling. Great, thanks. No yeah, I don't have much to add to that. I think we're all on the same page here. Uh, you know, there's no question, problem solving, you're going to have problems any company you go to. <laughs> so you got to figure out like, you know, what, what type of problems do you want to take on? Because uh, that's going to be the big question as you enter an organization. I think everybody knows that. Um, it's funny, the art of storytelling, I totally agree. I mean, you know, our brands are the three uh, individuals here. We're all about storytelling. 
And the one thing though, I learned very quickly at um, my first marketing company, P&G, is that they taught us the art of the one pager. They said, no PowerPoint. Make sure you can tell your strategy and objective and the problem in all one page. Not like an eight font or a five font, but a 12 font. Times New Roman, old school style. And uh, if you could do that, you have an art. I mean, same thing, I think what everybody reads about Bezos and like no PowerPoint, because anybody can force a PowerPoint presentation. Can you concisely tell your story and convince in a one page document? So practice that art. It's actually more important than you think it is, especially as you uh, talk to more and more leaders. And then um, third, I love the relationship building, but I also add to that and say, try to influence across cultures because it's one thing to build the relationship, it's another thing to influence. And it really depends on the different type of people you have to influence. And the only way to really do that is practice. And trust me, I think all of us probably made mistakes and you learn very quickly and adapt. Which comes to my last point, adaptability. All of us, in, especially in this world, have had to adapt. Uh, and not, not just on the three of us, every single person. The question is how quickly can you adapt and how effective are you at doing it? Uh, this is a tough one because in an interview, you're going to have a good story about adaptability, but in the real world, especially when you're doing this problem solving, uh, how, how much of a chameleon can you be uh, to adapt in the world that you have to be in? You know, so I just a challenge to all of you and, uh, you know, thanks again for having us on this uh, panel. That's great. I think that um, that's a great message for all our students. So Julie, Larry, and Q, I can't thank you enough for sharing your experiences and insights with us about this timely and important topic. I also would like to thank all of you who joined the webinar today. I hope you have enjoyed the program. We'll be back with another program on global sustainability in April 2021, next month. Until then, please stay safe and healthy.